My Romanian great-grandfather's surname, my mother's mother's father, was Sigil. Sigil means seal, the wax kind applied to a document to guarantee authenticity, like the English signet, related, of course, to signature. My great-grandfather was not, however, a seal maker any more than people named Cartwright build carts. After he came to America, he worked as a cigar roller. Coincidentally, his skin color was very close to the color of tobacco, as mine sometimes is in summer. The Sigils immigrated to Ellis Island in the early 20th century. They settled in Pittsburgh. They formed a community there with other Romanian Jews and founded a synagogue very near the one where on October 27, 2018, a man armed with an assault rifle shot and killed 11 Jews and wounded six others. My family visited Pittsburgh from North Carolina about once a year during my youth. We would see plenty of aunts, uncles, cousins, and old family friends. I found them difficult to relate to and was always uncomfortable around them. They tended toward thin, brittle-boned women with pinched faces, suspicious dispositions and disapproving attitudes, and slumped men who wore cheap suit coats and dented hats and complained of aches and pains. Gathered together on the astroturfed porch of my grandparents' house, these relatives managed to wrest out of their shared repression and resentments and ailments a querulous and garrulous sort of comedy. They laughed a lot, even though they did not seem like happy people, and what they laughed about didn't seem funny to me. It usually seemed like nothing at all. But they had a knack for making something out of this nothing, something which I could clearly recognize but would have had trouble identifying. A camaraderie, I suppose. I could come closest to describing it by recalling what my mother related to me many years later, a line she sometimes heard her kinfolk speak, with slight variations. Once you marry a sigil, that's it. You're a sigil. It wasn't what they said, but their way of speaking that made the deepest impression on me. All the Pittsburghers spoke in what I came to call, privately, mutterances. Yiddish has its own words and phrases that constellate around mutterance, like kvetch, tsuris, and especially oiveus mir. The Pittsburghers complained about their health, their work, their sports teams, their general lot in life, or someone else's lot, usually that of a family member not present, someone who was ill or ill-living. It seemed likely that after we visited and left town, or even just left the room, they had mutterances about us, too, and that strange, homely Pittsburgh accent which to me always sounded with its dredged consonants and distended vowels like a native geographical speech impediment, an impoverished accent and dialect. You gonna shul? One great uncle would say to another. Shul. Nowhere else did I hear this word, and it took me some time as a child to understand that its meaning was actually no different from synagogue, which was what my family called it, although we were not observant and seldom went to synagogue but the word shul stuck in my mouth like a swallow of medicine. It suggested something entirely unlike the place where you went to be closer to God. Maybe instead an old infirm relative in a nursing home. You gonna shul? The question was asked regardless of the day or time, it seemed, and often when the man being asked was already down the porch steps, cupping a lit cigarette in his hand, walking away, his back to the question of whether he was going to shul. In response, mutterances, Probably. I guess so. On the way home. Going to shul sounded like an errand. At best, the Pittsburgh version of synagogue called shul might be a place to go if you were in a bad mood, or long downtrodden, or derelict on some duty, which may have been the very duty of going to shul, or if you were feeling generally impotent and full of failure and phlegm. You went there not for spiritual succor, but for commiseration or even immiseration. It never occurred to me that maybe they went there just because it was a place where they felt like they belonged. I remember the exact date of the last time I ever went to Pittsburgh. I remember it because it was my sister's birthday. It was also the date when we buried my Uncle Larry. December 3rd, 2010. Uncle Larry was my mother's only sibling, her older brother by about three years. He was only 69 when he died, but even when I was a small child and he was still a fairly young man, he appeared sickly to me, prematurely old like the rest of the Pittsburghers. 
He walked slowly, uncomfortably, his voice toneless and creaky, and he seemed generally frail, retreating, resigned, constitutionally unhealthy, as though he were born that way. Uncle Larry was a hemophiliac. From early youth he had been treated gingerly by his parents, who taught my mother that she must do the same. Uncle Larry was not permitted to play sports or to do anything that might pose the threat of injury or danger. His life seemed never to have been permitted to be fully lived. After he died, my mother expressed condolences to his son, my first cousin, for the loss of his father. My cousin said, I lost my father a long time ago. Uncle Larry did not treat himself with the same care with which his family treated him. For one thing, for much of his life he smoked. The house he had with his wife and two children, who were around my age, was the first house I was ever in that smelled like cigarettes, stale ones. That ashy reek that has lived in walls and carpets for years and permeates everything in the house. It was also the first house I was ever in that was full of Tab, the diet soda, which at the time was virtually the only brand. Someone in their house was always drinking Tab, it seemed. There were six packs of Tab in their fridge, cases of Tab next to it, and many more in their pantry. There were larger bottles of Tab, too, and empties in the trash. It was in their house that I first tried Tab. I found it undrinkable, a sort of taunt to the palate, promising sweetness but withholding it from the senses and delivering instead a strange flavor that was also ashy, like the smell of the cigarettes. In the den of their house were fish tanks. Keeping fish was Uncle Larry's hobby. I watched him sprinkle fish food into the tanks, which glowed ghoulishly at night, as though he was keeping something nearly dead alive. I slept in the den with the fish tanks, on a sofa under the purplish light. When he wasn't feeding the fish, Uncle Larry seemed to spend a lot of time sitting in his easy chair, often complaining of very bad neck stiffness and pain that made it impossible for him to do very much. Or maybe, I wondered, did his not doing very much lead to the pain? The easy chair was rigged up with pads, some of them heated. His wife, my aunt, would tend to him chairside. She was a pharmacy tech. Uncle Larry seemed to be on a lot of medications. It occurred to me at one point to wonder if Tab might, in their eyes, be some sort of medical drink. My mother tells me Uncle Larry was hilariously funny. He did once tell me a funny story. It was about his business. He was a salesman employed by a company called Porter. I remember the name of the company because it was printed on a bottle stopper that worked by means of a rubber gasket on the underside, which formed a suction seal when you pressed down on the stopper. His parents, my Bubby and Zadie, had a number of these stoppers in their house in Pittsburgh. They used them regularly, although they drank Coca-Cola, not Tab. I had never seen a bottle stopper before, and I thought they were pretty neat. I also thought it was neat that Uncle Larry sold them for a living. I imagined him going door to door with them, or I tried to imagine it since his poor health made it difficult to envision him springing up steps onto porches in neighborhood after neighborhood, demonstrating the stopper's peerless suction action to interested residents. Have you got an open bottle of tab in the house, man? The bottle stoppers were not, of course, what Uncle Larry sold. They were almost surely a promotional item made by Porter to give clients as a mnemonic. To this day, I don't know what Porter produced or what Uncle Larry sold, and I never had any real idea what he did for a living. Both of my parents were teachers. I went to school, of course, and in fact one of my parents taught at my school, so I had a clear and first-hand understanding of their line of work. But it was hard to think of Uncle Larry working in any business, really, in his condition. I know he did, though, because of the funny story he told me when I was either a late adolescent or a young adult. Uncle Larry had a business meeting in Chicago, he told me, a half-day's drive from his home in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where he'd moved his family from Pittsburgh during my early childhood. His clients for this business meeting were also coming to Chicago from out of town, and he asked for their preferences for dinner after the meeting. Like him, they were Midwesterners, from somewhere like Kansas City or Omaha, and they expressed a desire for fresh seafood, which they seldom got to eat, being so far from any coast. So I made the necessary arrangements, Uncle Larry told me. I found this an interesting and curious choice of phrase, hard to get out of my head to this day. The necessary arrangements was curious, not only because of what an expression as oddly heightened as that implied about merely going out to dinner, 
a pastime I regarded as generally casual or offhand, and every now and then a special treat, but never necessary, nor requiring any arrangements. You simply walked into a restaurant, and if you wanted seafood, you found it on the menu and ordered it. Uncle Larry's choice of words surprised me, because he generally said very little around me, and when he did speak, it was in mutterances. He spoke in more mutterances than any of my other Pittsburgh relatives. He did not seem like someone who would say, necessary arrangements, long words which, despite their workaday meaning, had the ring of formal idiom, cultivated vocabulary, even a touch of stylishness. Coincidentally, the only other time I have ever come across the phrase necessary arrangements was in a book in which the necessary arrangements were those required by Jews to flee Nazi Germany. In any case, in both sound and sense, necessary arrangements made it clear to me that these clients were important to Uncle Larry or to Porter. There was a sense of eventfulness, even pressure, a need to get the necessities right with regard to these arrangements. Uncle Larry chose a restaurant and called to make something more than reservations, to make arrangements. He spoke with the manager or the maitre d', or perhaps even the owner, I don't quite remember. On the phone, he described the scenario, valued clients in from out of town, the client's desires for seafood, his desire, perhaps even the necessity of making arrangements to satisfy their desire. He might have requested a table away from the loudest part of the restaurant. The intricacies and art of doing business. I had not known Uncle Larry to be so practiced, so thorough, so skilled in the necessary arrangements. When the party was seated that evening, their waiter, or perhaps it was the owner or maitre d', with whom Uncle Larry had made the necessary arrangements, came to their table to give the party personal attention. After pleasantries were exchanged, he recommended the walleye. Uncle Larry paused for a moment in his story, as though to anticipate its conclusion. Then he said, First of all, walleye isn't seafood. Uncle Larry's full name was Larry M. Bellens. That's how it appeared on his birth certificate and in the obituary my mother wrote for him, her brother, which was prominently displayed in the funeral home on the day we buried him. Larry wasn't short for Lawrence, and the M didn't stand for anything. It was just the letter M. His father, my Zadie, who had been born Abraham Belansky but changed his first name to Herbert and shortened his surname to Bellens, didn't have a middle name but he thought his own children should have at least a middle initial. The necessary arrangements. <laughs>